uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I'm really uh, happy to be uh, live with you guys uh, here uh, on Facebook. Um, and I'm looking forward to chat with everyone and uh, get all the questions and uh, try to answer any of the questions you guys have. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm here right now. In, I'm in Bristol actually right now, just training for, uh, for Laguna next month. Uh, so yeah, just getting ready to play another competition there and uh, yeah, just uh, hoping to, uh, to do well and um, yeah, just um, play some good matches there with all my competitors. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. After my after black ball, I think I had a black I had black ball last month, and after black ball, I stayed in Egypt for like ten days, and then uh, go back to England. Um, yeah, and since that time, just been training really, and um, yeah, just really excited to uh, to know that I have the chance to compete next month, and uh, hopefully, you can get give some good matches for everyone. Uh, so yeah, so uh, please uh, fire away your questions, and uh, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm uh, I'm ready to answer any of the questions you guys have for me. So uh, I met Jancher. So yeah, so I met, I met Jancher. Uh, I met Jancher in Pakistan when I went there mid February. So the first time I meet him, I met a lot of the greatest, uh, lots, of, lots of the greats of the game. But uh, Jancher was the one that I haven't met, uh, and uh, I was really uh, looking forward to meet him. I uh, I've always wanted to speak with him, know, know about his mentality, learn from him. And it was a very unique experience to meet someone like him. And uh, I feel really lucky I was able to have dinner with him on one of the nights there. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's um, just the way he approached the game, the way he spoke about my game. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, a really, really nice human being. And uh, I was uh, really uh, felt lucky that I had that, that chance to, uh, to be able to meet, to meet him, definitely. Why do I think Sorov has lost to me in such close games the last couple of times? It's true, to be honest, the last, the last three times we played, uh, I mean, apart from the last time, the last time was three love in black ball, but all the games, was, the first couple of games could have gone either way. And then the time before to play in Canary Wharf where I beat him 12-10 in the third, and then the time before it were played in Channel Buzz, I think I beat him either 12-10 or 13-11 in the fifth. Um, I feel lucky that I was able to win those couple of matches, obviously. Uh, but Sorov has always been someone who... Um, uh, he, he always have a game that uh, that is really annoying for my game. So whenever I, I, I played him, I knew it was going to be always tough. Um, and um, yeah, he, uh, he, he just knows... Uh, he, he obviously, apart from his speed, Everyone speak about how quick he is on court, but actually he's such a good. He's an amazing squash player. He has such good accuracy. Uh, I know his movement is such a great asset of his game, but he has so much more to his game than his movement. And uh, yeah, that's the reason of why we have had such tough matches in the last few years. And uh, I have a good winning record, but believe me, that doesn't take the fact at all from how tough all our matches has been. <laughs> when do I plan to retire? Hopefully not soon. <laughs> Well, I just turned 33 years ago, so uh, so hopefully I still have a few years, a few more years in me left. I mean, um, as long as I, I can still play well, I will keep going. Um, I don't see myself retiring anytime soon. Uh, if if, um, if if you're going to ask me when I'm going to retire, then you need to ask that question to all my generation at the same time because we're all almost the same age. <laughs> then we're not going to have anyone on tour. <laughs> but hopefully myself and my generation, you know, Ali turned 21, 29 yesterday. I'm 30. Uh, my brother is going to turn 28 in a few months. Uh, Tarek is 33, 34. Um, Paul is 28, I think. So, so all of us are really around the same age. All of us it's our generation we're all around late 30s beginning of 30s now so so hopefully we can keep going for a few more years all of us and uh, hopefully we can give everyone a few more good matches um but yeah it's uh, it's a tough generation and i hope i can uh, keep going for a few more years what are the best drills to improve one's game uh, to, to be honest it's uh, there's a lot of uh, there is a lot of drills can be done uh, and uh, it, it depends on if you're doing them with a coach or in a solo practice. Uh, so f for me, I'm, I'm a bit old schoolish a little bit in terms of improving my game. If let's say my drop shot is 
not uh, is not accurate. I'm gonna go on court and hit drop shots for hours on court. Uh, so um, so that's the way I, I I train. You know, if something is 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 not working for me, I go on court and just work so hard on a daily basis on it till I get it right. Uh, obviously, there are things that you need to improve through technique. Uh, where even if you go through uh, on court to do hit solo for for an hour to improve a certain shot, if you're not if you're not hitting it with the right technique, then you're not um, you're not getting it perfectly as well. So uh, I think it's important to have the right coach behind you that can teach you the right technique and teach you how to hit the shot uh, well. Um, so yeah, so there is a lot of different drills. It just depends on what kind of shot you want to improve. How much of your training is on court and how much is off court? Uh, it also depends on uh, when the season is. Like uh, in the summer, for example, I mean, before before COVID, when we ha when we had uh, from uh, like July August uh, free from tournaments, that's when uh, I put so much work uh, into my physicality. Uh, it's like building up from uh, for the tournaments from September to June. Um, and that th those summers, it's a, it's a time where I'm building up so much of court stuff, uh, uh, doing some running, some gym work, uh, and then when the season starts from September till June, that's when uh, that's 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 when I I kind of in between tournaments you have like a couple couple of weeks off. If you reach finals, you have one week off. So it depends on. On where you lose in the tournament or if you win the tournament obviously if we keep winning tournaments you have much more less time to recover than everyone else but at the same time you have to be very clever on the way you in that week you have in between events you have to be really clever in it because no one can improve in a week but you can do things to refresh yourself mentally to be fresh men uh, to, to be fresh mentally for the next tournament so uh, it's about maintaining during the season your uh, fitness level your squash level but um when you're reaching a lot of finals during the season, it's very tough. It's very brutal uh, to be able to do a lot during the season. But um, at the same time, this you play more matches than everyone else. And you can think about it in two ways. It's either they make you tired and take a lot out of your body, or they actually make you get better and make you improve all the time. So it depends on the on the way, the mentally you approach things. So, um, so yeah, so as I said, it just, it depends on when the season is, when the tournaments are, and uh, that's what, what decide for me what I'm going to do on court or what I'm going to do off court. Tips did Janshir give me? Uh, a lot, but I'll keep them to myself. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He, he obviously spoke to me, he, he spoke to me a lot about uh, the mental side of the game, which is the side that I, uh, I like. Uh, this is, uh, I think, that uh, the side that makes the difference between the goods and the greats of the, of each of, in sports in general. Um, he spoke. He spoke to me about um, different. He, he he obviously did this for so many years on a consistent basis. So he had to play. He had to face different generations. Um, and um, I asked him a few questions about how, how he coped uh, between different generations. Because when he was young, he had to play Jahangir, but uh, his body was young at that time. And then when he got a bit older, he had to deal with the players younger than him, that, like Peter Nicola and Jonathan Power. So it's, uh, I asked him a few questions about how he dealt with it at different times in his career, because I could, uh, I could relate a little bit, because when I was young, obviously I had to deal with Greg, Nick, uh, Shabana, and that generation, but I was much younger than them, and now I'm 30, so I have to deal with players uh, who, like Diego, uh, Asal, all these players who are much younger than me. Uh, and obviously you have to deal with the players who are from his own generation, asked him how he dealt with them. So I, I can learn on how I can deal with players from my own generation, which are players like Ali, my brother, you know, all these guys. So I asked him about a lot of, I asked him a lot of, a lot of questions, to be honest, because you, you don't get this chance many times in your life. So I made sure I can, uh, I can get all the questions I've had in me to ask him for all my life, really. <laughs> how often do you do ghosting? Uh, how often do you, uh, how often do I do ghosting? So um, I do a bit of ghosting. Um, I wouldn't say, uh, uh, like it also depends. Uh, there is, uh, I do a lot of ghosting in between, the, during the season, definitely. Uh, and closer to the tournaments, I do a lot of ghosting. Um, but uh, it depends on the way the ghosting is very is very important 
um, and it's also not it's, and it's also very important to understand why you do it and how you do it and not just do it because you just have to do it or it doesn't make sense um, so it's important to get to understand how do you how you want to move and to understand what is the best movement for your body because everyone move differently Ali move different than me I move different to my brother my brother move different to Tarek Tarek move different to Paul Paul move different to D. so everyone moves differently uh, and everyone moves the best way it can work for himself um, so you need to work out what works for you and then when you find out what works for you now you can put ghosting sessions so you when you do the ghosting there is a better understanding on what you can do and uh, uh in your sessions what are my goals for the year ahead is there anything in particular you want to target yeah of course i there is always targets uh, i've always had targets every year uh always had long-term plans short-term plans obviously the the plans right now is to go back to world number one um it's not uh, it's not something it's not rocket science that i think everyone knows that this is my plans uh obviously the plan is to always win the british always win the world champ always win the big titles all the platinum events. Uh, my plan is to always win every single match I go to play. Um, obviously, I do lose matches, um, but I try to win most of my matches during the year. And uh, if I can do that for most of the year, then I'm doing a better job than the others. Um, but since I'm world number two right now, obviously right now I'm not. So. Um, so uh, right now the goal is to, to try and go back to world number one and uh, to try to get better as a squash player. But the intention of getting better as a squash player is to be the best player in the world. Uh, my mentality has always been what the point of getting better as a squash player if I'm not going to be world number one because, uh, and that is what works for me. But uh, as I said, everyone have to do what works for them. Um, I don't think everyone should think this way as well. Everyone should think differently. Uh, and do what works for them. But for me, I, I want to improve my game to see results. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do on a daily basis right now. Do I think Pakistan is safe to host any World Series events? Please comment on it. It's very important to hear from you all, especially you who visit Pakistan a couple of months ago. Uh, Pakistan is a very safe place. Uh, I went there, uh, I was invited and um, I did not hesitate to uh, uh, for a second not to go. Uh, uh, Pakistan is the country of squash. So um, to be able to go back there uh, was a very unique experience. The last time I was there was 2008. So it was my first time since 13 years ago. And uh, I really wanted to go. And uh, and uh, I wanted to meet Janshir. I wanted to see him as well. I wanted to meet... Uh, there is there is so much greatness in this country in our sport and all the greats of the game have played in pakistan uh, and won titles in pakistan and uh Chabana won his first world champ in pakistan and uh for example and that's he the first ever egyptian to win a world champ and so for pakistan for, for any squash player pakistan will always have a special place in their heart because uh because uh, because of all the history it has in our sport. And uh, I do think uh, it's time uh, that we do have platinum event there because I do not see the reason of why we don't, because I, 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 I do know that they want to. Uh, um, and uh, there was a time when we had, when the PSC had restrictions in terms of hosting tournament there a little bit, which was understandably maybe at the time, but right now I think it's, Right now, I think I went there and all the players who played the event went there and we all were really, really happy. We all felt safe. We all had a great time and um, everything was done very professionally in terms of organizing the event from first day to the last day. And uh, I, th I think it's time to, uh, yeah, to give a chance to the players that didn't go there to experience uh, how it feels playing there because it's a different experience, definitely. Barry Lee, uh, are you a court sprint kind of guy or just functional training on court? Uh, it's a very good question, I think. I think it's, uh, it depends. Uh, so when I was uh, young, from when I was seven, 17, when I, when I came on the PSA World Tour reading, when I was 16, I was uh, the sprint kind of guy. Uh, and 
Listen, I, I'm not the best mover on court in the out of my generation or the generations before me. Um, there has definitely been better movers than me in my generations and the generations before me and the generations after me. Um, but um, I knew when I was young, when I was 21, 22, when I had to play the generations older than me, like Nick and Greg, and I wanted to beat them and I wanted to be world number one on them. You know, I didn't want to wait for my turn. I, I knew that at this period to beat them, I needed to be the sprint kind of guy, even though the sprint kind of guy sometimes <laughs> sometimes doesn't play the, the, the best quality squash um, because they focus more on their physicality on court. Uh, rather than the quality on court. Uh, but I knew that the physicality on court would be a big advantage when I played the likes of Nick and Greg at my age when I was 21, 22, when they were at that time 30, 31, you know? Um, when at that time, they were the kind of guy that they were the functional training on court, you know? They were definitely more quality than me. They moved, they... they um, they took steps on court while I sprinted on court, basically. So, um, uh, but even if it didn't look pretty, even if their squash looked better on TV, not on TV, when, even if their squash looked better quality than me, but I knew that uh, uh, my physicality at that age would, would get the better out of them in, the most, in most of my matches against them. I wouldn't say all, obviously, because I've lost some of the matches. I've won, more, I've won some of the matches. But when I got to the age of 21, 22, when I got to world number one, uh, when they were playing at a good level uh, and I was beating them most than I lost to them at the time, I was definitely using my physicality more than my squash at that time, I would say. So I was definitely making sure I get everything back on court. Uh, if they hit winners, I make sure that I make them hit an another extra shot. Uh, and I knew... If we go to a fifth game, I had that advantage always. Um, I think rarely at that time I lost to a fifth. I lost a fifth game against Gregor Neck at that time. Um, and then as I'm getting older now, now I've started to be functional training, use the functional training on court more. So that's why I changed my game a lot, uh, changed my movement a lot because I, as you're getting older, you need to use the quality more. So I'm starting to use what Nick and Greg were trying to do against me when they were in their thirties. And that's the experience that you need to do, basically. So that's what I'm trying to do against my own generation, against the generation younger than them. Um, so yeah, so I think I think part of the thing that made me be at the top of the game for a long time is understanding what worked well for me at each period in my career. And um, yeah, so right now that's what I'm doing. And sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. It doesn't. <laughs> do I have a favorite tournament? Uh, yeah. Um, I'll, there are a few events that I really, really enjoy playing, but the most event that I really love playing it was a, a tournament we had in Cartagena. It, was, it happened only for one year, Cartagena, Colombia. It's we had an amazing time. I played a, it was a great event. Uh, it's more of a, it's a, like a, it's like an island. It's an island in Colombia, and uh, it it was just an amazing fun, really. And, uh, and it's a shame it never happened again, but. But obviously, from 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 the one that we always play the TC, you know, it's hard to be that one. You know, the the uh, like the crowd get there involved from the first day. I've had great time there. You know, I won the event three times. Uh, I've had mixed emotion there. Some great matches, some bad memories there. You know, like uh, as I said, I won the event three times. You know, and it's great to play in front of the crowd every day. But also, Greg beat me there when he. Uh, uh, you know, killed me in that semi-final of the TC. So uh, I've had some good and bad memories there, definitely. But uh, I've always enjoyed being on court uh, whenever I went there. And I really, really miss uh, being there, being back. And uh, I can't wait to be back in January. Who do I find my toughest opponent and why? Uh, I play, I've had so many opponents over the years in my career. Each one, each one of my rivals represented something difficult against me that was so unique. Um, I would say my, uh, I would say my toughest opponent uh, from all the people that I played against, I would say Ali, uh, definitely. Uh, I would say my toughest opponent on the day was Rami. Uh, there is a difference. There is a difference between saying uh, who was tougher on the day and who is tougher. Uh, who is tougher in the long term. Uh, the reason of why on the day I'm saying Rami is because Rami 
when he was playing well, he was the best player I've ever played against. Um, but I have never had to face Rami for a whole season because he was getting injured. And the time when Rami was uh, was uh, playing well for a whole season, when he didn't lose a match for 55 consecutive match, I think I was I was 19 or 20 years old. So I was not really part of the group that was really... Uh, um, I wouldn't say I was a rival at the time. It was more of Nick, Shabana, Jim. These are the guys that were really challenging Rami at the time. And then when I, I think when I was 21, 22, that's the time when I started really being more consistent as a top four, top three player. Uh, that's when Rami started struggling with a lot of injuries and we, we would play only twice a season. But when Rami would come back and play, he was definitely better than anyone I have played against. Uh, the reason of why Ali is uh, tougher than the players I have played against, I think his consistency um, is definitely better than any of the other guys I have had to face in my career. Um, and um, I think at the time when I was one number one, when I was 20, the phase from 22 to 25 years old, um, Ali was not really on the scene at that time. Uh, Ali was world number eight, number nine at that time. To be consistent, uh, to be to be staying consistent at world number one, I I used to um, peak for the big events, for the seven big events during the season. And I think one of the season I won six out of them, but I didn't do well in the smaller events. Um, and uh, I think I used to use them kind of to peak for the big events. I had to be to manage my body and manage the way. Uh, I was playing a, a little bit because I wanted to win the big events. and uh, But Ali forced me to focus and play well on the smaller events. I think there was one season, the season that, the first season that Ali overtook me as world number one. That season, I actually won three out of seven big events and I still, and still Ali overtook me. Um, and I think if I did those results three, four years ago, there were, I would have still been world number one. So that's how tough the challenge he represented me when he came on the scene. So... Ali forces me to focus more on uh, winning the smaller events. And that's why the last couple of years, I have won Shanghai, I have won San Fran, uh, I have won Canary Wharf. These are events I, I didn't, from 22 to 26, I didn't win many of them actually in my career. So um, it's a different challenge, but it definitely keeps me, uh, it, it makes me think on how I can stay uh, at, uh, at playing at a good level for a whole year. Uh, thanks. Are you happy about the Egyptian dominance at the moment or would you prefer a more var uh, varied field? And what do you think is better for squash as a sport in general? I think uh, what's better for sport in general is obviously to have many countries, uh, varieties competing at the top level. Uh, that would be that what would be good for any sports, not just squash. Uh, and um, the Egyptian dominance... Um, I mean, we live, we live in a time where Egypt is completely dominating the sport. Uh, and, uh, and, and you just never know what happens from now in 20 years' time. 20 years ago, Australia had seven players inside the top 10, and now they don't have one player inside the top 100. So imagine in 20 years, Egypt don't have one player inside the top 100, you know? So you just never know, you know? <laughs> I don't think hopefully that will happen, but... Uh, but uh, I just think the reason of this is because we always had um, one or two great players in each generation that we all looked up at. Like I remember when I was 15, I, um, I, uh, I saw Shabana being world number one. I, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to do the things he did. And when Shabana got, won his first world champ and he was the first Egyptian to win it, I he made it more uh, believable for us. Let's put it this way. Uh, and when he got to world number one for 33 months and he was the most Egyptian who got to world number one, I was like, actually, I want to go to world number one and I want to break that record one day. So, uh, so it, 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 because he got there for 33 months, it, it made me not only want to go there, but it made me have the mentality of actually, I want to get there and stay there for as long as possible. And now I'm staying, I know I stayed there for 49 months and now the, the next generation, when they they get to wall number one, they'll be thinking, okay, sure, buggy got to 49. I want to pass that. And then we're going to get an even better Egyptian player, you know? So, so it's, um, records are meant to be broken and that's how records are broken is because the generations comes after you and they see your records and they want to break it. And uh, that's what happened with me when I saw Shabana's record and that's what's happening in the next generation with my record right now. So, so it's, I think that, what we have right now, we have just 
in generations after generations learning from each other and they're just getting better and better but um, yeah i mean it's 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 definitely it, it's hard because it's hard the egyptian when we play each other it's tough matches there is so much into it as well um when you play someone from your country from your the same country you know and uh, it's, it's just mentally it's different it's tougher uh but at the same time it makes the challenge even higher and it, we all improve as squash players do i believe my brother will reach world number one spots uh while you are still on tour um I hope not, <laughs> and I hope yes. <laughs> so I hope my brother, obviously, when my brother won Black Bull, I was the happiest person on this planet that he won the tournament. Um, and the first person my brother called on the phone once he went off court while, while he was still with his sweaty clothes when the camera got on him was actually me. So that's the kind of relationship we both have. Um, when I play him on court, I try to stop him from winning. When he plays me on court, he tries to stop me from winning, obviously, uh, which is, we both hate that. But uh, I do believe my brother have the potential to be world number one. I do believe all the top guys have the potential to be world number one, but not everyone who has the potential to be world number one can get to be world number one. So, uh, so um, there is so much work to be done to be world number one, the consistency to get there is uh, pretty unbelievable uh, there is so much work to be done my brother has has proved over the years that he can beat anyone on tour um, to get to one number one um, it's a different challenge that there is a challenge in proving that you can beat anyone on tour and there is another challenge which i think my brother did uh, and he did so many times actually he has beaten me a few times he beaten ali more time than ali beat him um, uh, but it's another challenge to to be world number one, and that's a challenge that my brother has to face right now. And um, he's the only one who who uh, who can show us whether he can um, can succeed at this challenge or not. Do I think it would be better to play tournaments like World Championships and bigger tournaments in place like Canary Wharf, where it's packed from the first day instead of trying to promote the sport and lack a lot of spectators? Uh, it depends. Uh, I think a bit of both. Uh, you look at tennis, for example, uh, you go to watch the matches in Qatar, uh, Dubai. Uh, you go watch uh, the first few rounds. Uh, the, actually, the tickets there are free tickets, you know, and uh, uh, people don't have, I mean, I don't know, it's still today, but at the time when my dad lived in Dubai and Qatar, it was free tickets and uh, you have players like Djokovic and Federer and all these guys playing there in the first few rounds and not many people are actually, it's not packed so so when we go to play in qatar or 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 or, or there or, or in the middle east sometimes the first few rounds yeah it's not packed but we get it packed by the same age quarter finals um it's it it would definitely be better for the sport to have to have a world champion canary wharf one day what an amazing location what an amazing event tim garner does every year he promotes it very well uh um tournament like the TUC, the Grand Central Station. We never, I'm not sure if we had the World Champ there one year or not. I mean, not in my time at least. But I, I, I do hope we do have it there in my time one day because it's a great venue for a World Champ. Uh, I mean, it's as I said, it's we need a bit of both. <laughs> How do I think COVID will affect World's men's team event in New Zealand this year? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, I, I haven't heard anything about it, to be honest. The, there have been a lot of restrictions uh, from what I've been reading there in New Zealand and Australia, obviously, um, with the hotel hotel quarantine there, uh, and uh, people have to pay for it and all of this. Um, but at the same time, they don't have any COVID cases there. <laughs> so um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, to be honest. There's still a lot of time to, for December. So um, let's see what happens. Do I see squash in the Olympics soon? Why is European squash is not being included? Um, there is so much politics in having squash and being the Olympics. Uh, we did everything I think uh, we have been asked to do in terms of TV, marketing the sport and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I think it's, it takes much more than this. Do I think squash will be in the Olympics soon? 
I don't think so, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I hope we're going to have squash in the Olympics one day. Um, but I don't think we as a sport are playing the political game very well to get there one day. And unless we do that, um, we won't. Um, so I don't see that we have been. Uh, I have been in the sport playing in the PSA since I was 15 years old. So it's been 15 years. We've been saying we, uh, about the Olympics, about the Olympics, and we haven't been. So um, something is wrong, obviously, if we haven't been able to get into the Olympics till today. And um, yeah, as I said, it's a political game rather than doing what's right and what we've been asked from us. Uh, and un uh, unless we're going to play the political game well, we have no chance in getting there. And so far, we haven't been able to. Name two rules and squares that I would like to change. Um, hmm. These are the kind of questions that, that I would have had, I would have wanted some time to think about before before the question. <laughs> uh, Naming two rules and squares would like to change. I think I would like to. To be honest, like anything, any any rules in any sport, you know, it's there are there are a lot of things you can always change in 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 any sport. But uh, but I think the sport right now is in good place. I think I think there will always be arguments on uh, on uh, on decisions. There will always be arguments on if they're free to if they're free took the right decisions or not. If the players are taking the the right lines or not, if the players are taking too much space or not, there will always be people talking. Um, and and for me, like the mentality is always get on with it. Uh, always just try and just think on how you can find a way to win, how to just to stay focused on the match. We will never all agree on the same thing, but um, it's the players who try and get on with it are the players who find are more successful than others so, so yeah so um yeah do i use uh, original grips or replacement grips i use original grips <laughs> tell us about the tuc 2017 again it's very good that match was so good to watch <laughs> maybe it was good for you guys but not good for me <laughs> well to be honest with you like the way i thought about it um When you go on court, there are, every player ha you have to have so many weapons. That's the way I think about it. And it's like when you go to war, you have different, every army have different type of weapons, for example. So every squash battle for me, I take it like a war. And especially with that generation, with Greg and Nick, it was a war every time it went on court. Uh, and I miss these matches, to be honest with you, because uh, there was so much mentality going on. These guys were warriors, you know, and uh, and uh, so you go on court with any of these guys, you have to have many weapons, you know, and um, and the way I thought about it, Greg used to, I mean, Greg went to love up. He was beating me. He was playing very well. The match was high quality. And I we had a very tough third game, which I won 11-9. And... Uh, that's when the momentum started shifting. And that's when I was saying I was 24 years old at the time, Greg was 32. So definitely the physicality was on my side. And once I won the third game, 11-9, I could see Greg was started to be affected physically. And I could see that the faster I'm gonna go, the, the momentum was gonna even shift even more with me. Um, and that's when Greg obviously knew that he cannot use physicality with me anymore. And he started to, um, think how can I take this guy out of his focus in the match? How can I, um, how can I, um, how can I beat this guy? And that's the way that Greg found a way to win was to, to take me out of my focus completely and to, to just, uh, he definitely knew what he was doing. Um, and it was my mistake. I've never blamed anyone. I went off court and I told myself it was completely my mistake. I, I, I should, be as a professional athlete, I should be always prepared for any kind of tricks being used against me. Um, and uh, if he used that trick against me, I should have been prepared enough 
um, to be able to deal with it and still win the match. Because every before every time I go on court, I always think, how can I put myself into a position to have the best possibility of winning the match, even if I'm not at my best? Um, and I didn't that match. So um, that's why after that match, I have never moaned. You would never find me talking about this match, complaining or mourning. I have never moaned about it on social media. I have never complained. Very rarely I do, really. All I did was every time I trained, I just thought about this match and thought that if someone do something against me like this again, how I can respond to it next time. Um, yeah, and um, that, the way, that was my opinion regarding the match. Which player inspired me the most? Um, um, a lot of players inspired me, to be honest. Um, the most players that inspires me, I would say, are my rivals. Um, I want to beat them, but they inspire me at the same time. Ali inspires me a lot. Uh, Nick inspired me a lot. Rami inspired me a lot. Shabana inspired me. Greg inspired me. James did. All of these guys to get to the level of what, where they got, um, they um, they have to they had to sacrifice a lot in their life. They had to be mentally very strong, and uh, I respect all of them for uh, for doing what they did because. I have done it myself, so I know how difficult it is. And I know how unique you have to be to be able to sustain that level of consistency for so many years. Um, so all of these guys and the greats above them that did it for so many years, all of them have really inspired me in my career. And um, yeah, <laughs> I have already won the world champ and world number one. What, what dreams do you have remaining in your career? Uh, I have so many years I still want to chase and I have so many dreams I still want to achieve. You know, my dreams were never to be world number one. My dreams were never to win the world champs. My dreams were, how long can I be world number one for? How many of this title can I win? How many of that title can I win? Because the moment I win a trophy, the, um, the time that I only enjoy for a few seconds, which is the time I am on court holding a trophy, the moment I'm out of the court, uh, I'm, I'm already thinking about next week, about the next competition, because my enjoyment, my enjoyment, my enjoyment is in the next one, in the next one, in the next one. So um, the moment I enjoy a tournament, you know, I'm, I'm not hungry, I'm, I'm satisfied. And the feeling of satisfaction is not a good feeling. Um, so, um, there is still a lot of dreams to achieve, and um, here I am trying to be the best I can, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to go after these dreams. <laughs> How much has Rodney improved my game, and uh, what way compared to your other coaches? Uh, so Rodney had a big understanding, Rodney Martin had a big understanding in the game of squash. Very unique, actually. Um, I've, I've, I've had great coaches behind me in my career. Uh, each one of them have given me something unique and something uh, that is um, um, th that stayed with me for the rest of my career. Even the coaches that I'm not with anymore, I still have all their advices in my head till today. Uh, I've had I started in Egypt, Gamal Awad, who played one of the longest matches of, on the history with Jahangir, who got world number two. And then I went to England uh, with John Barrington, and then Hadrian now uh, here. And then I went to Palmer and then Rodney. So, so I've had a lot of big names behind me. Shabana, when he coached in the national coach for a year, I was world number one. So he stayed with me in every tournament for every tournament. So I've learned during that year so much from him. So, so I've had big names behind me in my career. Uh, and, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and that's due because I love learning. I love learning something different. And uh, each one of them done something different in his career, so unique uh, that I wanted to go to each of them and learn it. Um, and yeah, Rodney, uh, I spoke to him two years ago and um, yeah, I found so, there are, there are many weaknesses in my game that I think uh, that I could see in my game that I wanted to improve and uh, and uh, I, these weaknesses, uh, I wanted to uh, be some uh, to be coached by someone who, who his strengths was my weaknesses, uh, uh, and that's why I went to Rodney. And um, and uh, I didn't speak to him much before before I trained with him. Actually, not like the, all the other coaches like Palmer before. Uh, 
before I started training with him, I actually played against him before he retired. So I spoke to with him a few times. So I knew his character. But Rodney, I didn't know his character at all before I, I went to him, uh, which was, uh, was uh, something which was uh, always gave me a lot of interest in getting to know him as well, to know his character. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy and I really enjoying working with him. Obviously, due to the pandemic, uh, I haven't had that chance to be with him on court as much as I would like to. Uh, but uh, we have done some video analyzing so much and we're still doing and um, yeah, let's see how far we can go together. What motivates me the most about my profession as an athlete? In other words, what keeps you pushing so far since you have already broken the record many times and did many great historical matches? What motivates me the most about my profession is uh, winning. Uh, I love winning. I love the feeling of winning and I hate losing. Um, I love I love being the best player in the world. Uh, I hate being the world number two. <laughs> I think it's um, the world number two is the first of losers. I always see it this way. <laughs> so uh, there is always one winner in every tournament I play. It's the winner of the event. There are players who do well in an event who can beat great players but then losing the same as or losing the final. And then they say after their event, they can, people say about them, oh, they had a great event, they're going to the right track. For me, that doesn't work. For me, what works is someone who's holding the trophy and someone is not. And what I do and what motivates me is to try and hold that trophy every single time and go uh, and play a tournament. And uh, as, as long as I still have that feeling in me and, and that desire in me, I'm gonna keep going as long as I can. The moment I lose that desire, then you know that I shouldn't be going on court because there is no point. So what motivates me is, is to try and beat records after records after records. You know, I'm, I'm chasing records. I'm not chasing. Uh, I'm not trying to beat someone right now. I'm trying to beat my own records. I'm trying to beat other great records. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, and that's what motivates me the most right now. I, I, I do a lot of training. I, I do believe that the mental side of the game is the most important side of the sport or in any sport. Uh, I'm not the most talented player. I don't move the best on court out of my generation. I'm not the most talented out of my generation. I'm not the tallest out of generation. my generation. I'm not the shortest. I'm not the quickest. But uh, for a long time in my career, I stayed um, a good time as world number one uh, and I, I think that's due to my mental side of the sport um, and um, yeah I think um, I, I think the mental side you know it's um, it, what, what makes the difference between the greats and the good uh, there are a lot of good players that are so talented and they can beat anyone on their day but they can never do it on a consistent basis you can see them winning uh, a platinum event um, out of the blue, to be honest, sometimes. And then you don't see them for the rest of the year doing the same thing. So, um, so yeah, so, so for me, it's about consistency, to be honest. So that's the mental side of the game is to be able to finish one event, go and back it up the next event. There, and you will always have niggles in your body. You will, there, you will always have excuses not to win, but... It's the people that don't hold on to these excuses and to and that give it their best shot every time they go on court. Believe me, they're the one that stay consistent better than others. What kind of food do I eat before match days? Um, so it depends as well, to be honest. So I, I like to eat around four to five hours before matches. I remember when I was 20, 20 I remember when I was 20, 19 years old. Uh, I was with Shabana once eating and I was eating three hours before the ma my match and Shabana's match was two hours after me and he was eating five hours before the match and he was like I think 31, 32 at that time and um, he was like are you eating three hours before the match how and then uh, he was like just yeah just give it another four or five years and that's when your digestion system starts to be a bit slower and then now I eat like four or five hours before the match I can't if I eat three hours before the match I, I might vomit during the match or something so so I, I just make sure I just have a salad, just a little bit, a little bit of protein for the match. You need something that, that obviously doesn't stay in your system for a long time, so you can stay alive during the match. And once you finish the match, you need to get a lot of protein in your system within the hours after the match. So, so yeah. 
which country do I think is up and coming in squash? Um, well, I think uh, the States have a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, great players coming from the States, I think. A lot of great Egyptian squash coaches are in the States right now. A lot of, uh, Egypt, a lot of great Egyptian squash coaches who, who actually coached a lot of the generations that are playing right now are in Egypt, uh, sorry, are in the States. Um, I think there is a very good generation of French players playing right now. Uh, I think uh, Hong Kong and Malaysia have uh, a lot of good juniors at the moment. I've been following what they've been up to. Um, but nothing that can scare, nothing that can uh, take the dominance of the Egyptians in the near future, I think, in the next 10 years at least. Like, uh, like I can see, like I, I'm not sure I might be wrong, but I can see generations, Egyptian generations dominating the sport till probably Asal, Asal comes up as well, you know. Uh, I'm not sure the generations in Egypt after Asal, um, but uh, I think till, I think we're in safe hands till at least Asal. Are there periods that you go through where you feel you might be bored or feel temporary loss of passion interest? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've had that period uh, once in my career, actually, during the 2016-17 season. That's the season where I lost a lot of hunger, lost a lot of motivation. I had a lot of personal issues off court, actually. Um, I, I lost the world number one that season. I got back to all number three. I lost the world champ that day. That day, Gawad won the world champ, actually, in Egypt. And that's the season as well that uh, Greg did uh, beat me in the TUC semis. I was going through a lot of issues of the court that I've never really spoken about because I never really like to give excuses. Um, it was my issue to deal with it and try to win matches on court. And I couldn't do that. I didn't do a good job at it. It was only till, and it was that season where I lost hunger, I lost motivation. And at the end of that season, uh, at the end of that 2016-17 season, um, before I went to the World Series Finals in Dubai, three weeks before it, I um, I started uh, being angry at myself that I lost my ranking. I got back to number three. Um, I started being angry at myself because I was reading a lot of stuff on social media as well, saying that uh, because at that time my generation started stepping it up. There was a lot of stuff was being said that I was finished, that, uh, that my generations are starting to take over from me because Gawad got to world number one. Ali beat me a few times that season. My brother beat me in 19 minutes in Elguna. Uh, so obviously it got into me. It, I got really angry at myself. And then that summer I, I went to the World Series Finals. I won it, I think. Uh, and then uh, I had three months of summer training and uh, I really trained so hard during that summer uh, to go back to world number one. And then I remember I got six finals in a row. I ended up winning the world champ in Manchester. So yeah, you go through phases like this in your career. That's the only phase I went like that during my career, to be honest, due to stuff I went off court, um, due to issues I had off court. But um, I promised myself from that time that I will never want to go through that period again in my life. Why do I think, why do I think uh, Australia has regressed so much in squash when it was once successful at an international event? Uh, international level. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Like I have had Palmer and Rodney Martin in my coaching camp in my career, and uh, they were two of those seven great players that were inside the top 10 from Australia during that time. So that's actually one of the reasons of why I like the Australian, Australian way of teaching, because when they were all playing and each other at that time, they had so much knowledge in the sport because they, I'm sure they were talking to each other. They shared so much knowledge to each other. Right now, I think that Egyptian group in 20 years time, or like even 10 years time, they will have so, we will all have so much knowledge in the sport because we all know each other. We all have seen how each other done it his way a little bit, you know, and we learn from each other so much, you know. So uh, um, I think, I, I, I'm not sure, the politics they had in their country with the federation or the coaching system there, but something must have happened for this to happen. And the people who are who are in charge of this, I mean, I don't want to say they have done a bad job at it because they obviously did a bad job at it uh, to for for this to happen because to not have one player inside the top hundred that's. Uh, 
there is no excuse for that after having seven players inside the top 10. And um, especially when you have great coaches at the moment from Australia, you have Palmer, you have Rodney Martin, you have Rodney Isles. I don't want to miss someone, but you have so many greats. You have Stuart Boswell, you have so many. But but right now, you have Boswell living there. You have Jenny Dunkelf, you have Vicky Bo uh, uh, Botwright. Uh, you have... Um, um, I don't want to miss someone. Uh, Rachel, obviously, Graham. So, so there are so many great names who have went back to Australia and are coaching the national team there now, the national junior team. So I hope that Australia come back in the sport again because, like Pakistan, there is so much history, history in the sport uh, for our sport in Australia. Uh, attributes and also negatives to your game, do I think I have? Uh, I think my mental side of the game, uh, I would say that's my greatest strength. Um, uh, I think anyone who stayed at the sport at a consistent basis, uh, it will be the same answer. It will be their mental side of the game. Uh, um, it's definitely, um, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely not talent. I don't think I'm the most talented player, so I don't think <laughs> that's my greatest attribute. Uh, if if it's someone like Gawad, definitely his greatest attribute is his talent. Like, believe me, when I play Gawad, I'm his. I'm his biggest fan. Uh, like I'm more of a fan of his game more than the people watching in the crowd. <laughs> uh, he's definitely like I love watching him. He's the most I love watching out of my own generation. Uh, what are my negatives to my game? Uh, I definitely lost my mind a few times on court. Um, um, uh, of course, there are a lot of negative. There are negatives that I have in my game because. The most successful people in the sport are the most who criticize themselves. I criticize myself, believe me, more than anyone can criticize me. And that's the reason of why I'll, I, I have improvement in, in my game every season. Um, and I don't wait for someone to criticize me. Uh, when, 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 when I beat Ali in Canary Wharf, when we had that great match in the 2000, in, uh, 2020 last year in Canary Wharf when I beat him 3-1. Uh, great match. I played one of the greatest matches in my career. Uh, we both played great match. On the drive back, I was driving back with Hedin, which is within an hour in the match. Uh, the whole way, most of the way on the way back, I was not celebrating. I was actually talking about the game that I lost. I, I was talking to you, why did I lose that game? Uh, of course, against Ali, you're going to lose games. You're not going to win every match because you are big rivals against, against each other. But I was criticizing myself instead of celebrating on why did I lose that game instead of celebrating my win. And um, I'm sure a lot of great players in their own sports, they do similar stuff. So I found negatives in different matches in my matches. So... I can't really speak very openly about what are the negatives I think about my game, but hopefully, you know, I'm 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 hitting against Jordan making actually in, in in three hours. Actually, we're having a nice training match against each other, and I'm gonna try and improve some of these negatives in, in a little bit. <laughs> there, is, there is a big difference playing uh, playing players. There are there are players who are great squash players, but they don't have a big presence on court, and there are players that don't play as good but they have huge presence on court, you know? And it's important to know the strengths and weaknesses of your opponent. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and, you wanna decide, and, you, and you want to decide what you want to do. You want to decide um, the plan and tactic before you go on court, because there are moments where you can make that strength be a weakness. And there are moments where that weakness can be a strength. So it depends on, uh, it, dep it depends really on the tactic that you put with your coach and your team before. Uh, sometimes you go on court and once you, um, I, I mean, sometimes you go on court and then you, you see your opponent's face is nervous. Then in a second, you have to change your tactic. Uh, sometimes you have to make last second adjustment as well. So it's great to have a team behind you, a great team behind you, behind you that can put tactics and can talk, up, talk tactics with. But at the same time, the player himself has to be clever enough to adjust because it's all about adjustment in the match. And at the top level, you have to adjust all the time because, because the great players 
once you go on court with them, they will understand what you're trying to do against them very quickly, quicker than the other players. And that's when they're going to change their tactics and adjust. And that's when I will have to adjust. So that's why uh, I love my matches against my main rivals in my career, you know, because there was so much into them than just... Uh, a lot of people just watch us playing against each other and it's great matches, but there is actually so much goes into them in terms of tactics and plan. And the tactics keep changing during the same game itself two and three times. And that just makes you mentally want to improve and you have to be strong mentally all the time. So um, I really, really enjoyed uh, talking to everyone today. Uh, I really have had a lot of interesting questions, a lot of great questions. Uh, I have watched some of the Facebook Live, the other squash player that they did, and I've loved it. Uh, and I hope uh, and I could see how uh, much people uh, found them interesting and they loved the, the Facebook Live with the other players. And I hope that uh, mine, you guys enjoyed it as well. And um, hopefully I can do another one in the future. And for now, uh, I promise everyone I'll keep training as hard as I can and be as good as I can be in Elguna.